Hi, Fred. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. I guess we've got people from all different parts of the world. So happy Thanksgiving for all those guys who are in the United States and hmm. probably could not join because of that. And uh, good to see you, uh, Trista. Uh, see you she's too. out of uh, Tokyo. And and we have Toshi. Toshihiro Hi. Toyoshima, also yes. from uh, Tokyo. So we've from got Tokyo. two people from Tokyo. And my name is Neera Charan, and I'll be moderating this panel. As you know, the subject is about COVID proofing Asian businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a very large, uh, broad speaking um, interpretation of it. And uh, one of the most trillion dollar questions that people would love to have an answer for going forward, because we're still in the middle of it. I don't think we, we, we might be in the tail mm -hmm. of it, but we are still in it. So we're not mm -hmm. out of it. So that brings us to some very interesting conversation. We are three of us and two of uh, other uh, could not join because of their personal reasons and Thanksgiving. So Trista, mm -hmm. uh, she's the co-founder of um, uh, Read There Japan. She's an author. Mm -hmm. You've ri written a book on uh, leading sustainability path. And mm -hmm. I know you're talking about a lot in regard to you know, sustainable uh, business, smart business, the mind shift, uh, go deeper into it. You've got experience from the United States, the Americas, mm -hmm. Europe, and Asia. Um, you've, you've had, I think you've had uh, experience in uh, consumer products, in, in media, technology, healthcare, financial. So we could not have had a better uh, panelist <laughs> than Trista. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I'll start with the first question with Trista, and then we'll, I'll, I'll go to uh, Toshi later. And then at that time, you can yeah, have sure. your introduction, Toshi. So, so Trista, you know, the pandemic seems to have uh, moved a lot of uh, environmental social governance, right? And, and um, sustainability to the top of the agenda for all business leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, why and how did this happen? Uh, and how do you see this evolve going forward, both in Asia as well as global? If that could be the first question I might ask you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. So I think that, you know, the funny thing is that back when the pandemic hit, I think a lot of people, we started to see even before that a shift towards these topics, you know, what's going on with the environment, certainly climate change. We had all the COP summits, um, certainly the previous U.S. administration, you know, who was not really um, terribly um, engaged in this topic, you know, really kind of started a debate around whether we should be focusing on things like climate or things like social issues and such. And uh, what was happening was, you know, uh, younger people who were the new consumers and the new employees were starting to express concerns about these issues. And that was, you know, that predated COVID. Then when COVID hit, I think everybody thought that actually the reverse would happen that people would forego thinking about these topics and then would kind of go back to, well, how can we um, get uh, back to spending and back to normality as quickly as possible? And that actually didn't happen, which was interesting. I think uh, COVID really forced a reflection on what are the areas that we should be focusing on? What is this gonna mean for our future? Um, I think it was such a, um, a shock in terms of our models, in terms of how we operated, that people started to reflect on, well, actually, maybe we should be mm -hmm. thinking about things like, um, like what's going to happen with the climate change? How is that going to impact us? And I think, you know, to be honest, we didn't, I, I guess you could say we responded to, to COVID probably better than previous generations may have, but maybe not as well as we thought we would have. <laughs> and I think we felt very unprepared. So people started to think, well, what happens if something else disruptive happens? Maybe another pandemic that's worse, maybe um, a climate shock. Are we really prepared to deal with this? And companies started to think about things. You know, my area of focus is principally business, um, not so much um, um, policy or government. But I think business started to think about, well, what happens? You know, how do we manage through another shock? We weren't prepared this time. How do we get prepared next time? And naturally, that kind of dovetailed um, with, with sustainability topics and issues. And also, of course, you know, if we have permanent disruption to countries, to land, to supply chains, to how we basically operate, what is that going to mean for us as a business? So we started to see these companies really embracing that. At the same time, you saw investors 
who are really alarmed, I think, about the fact that companies aren't necessarily prepared. And now what we're seeing again, you know, we still are not out of the pandemic. We're having massive supply chain issues. Um, and, you know, certainly there's a demand issue as well and a labor labor constraints that are causing that. But also we're starting to see some CEOs that are saying that actually the sustainability issues are starting to disrupt. Supply chain. So it makes sense that this has really kind of moved up the agenda for many uh, business leaders. US 01 LV. I kind of trust. I think there is a uh, feedback audio coming from somewhere. Can you guys also hear it? Yes. Hi, hi, Michael. Good morning. Can you hear us, Michael? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, yeah. I guess, uh, uh, Michael, I, I'm assuming you're in the United States at this time. And uh, uh, happy Thanksgiving, I know. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, more, very early morning for you, I guess. Yeah, so on Friday morning, uh, hmm. Thanksgiving morning. Yes, Friday. Yeah. So uh, good, good to have you here on board. I was not sure about. Uh, so, so Michael is uh, a board member of the uh, Capital Group in the United States, hmm. and uh, as you know, Michael, the subject we are talking about is about. Uh, COVID proofing of Asian businesses, but we are trying to take it to a larger perspective, uh, right. both because A, we are still in it, and while we may have finished most part of it, but you never know, we hear of all kind right. of third and fourth wave and fifth wave, and sometimes I wonder why we keep talking about this so much. So uh, just to tease a question to you, your first initial thoughts on this, Michael. Mm -hmm. Well, the um, the current world has one big advantage and one big disadvantage hmm. the for businesses and with COVID. The big advantage is, of course, we've made a lot of progress in combating the spread of COVID with vaccines and knowledge. Uh, we know the distance to avoid infection and we have ability to uh, several vaccines that work. The big disadvantage is in Asia, there is no central authority and no one to sort of uh, rule to say, let's do this or let's do that and, and so forth. And for instance, in Portugal, the big advantage was they turned their anti-COVID uh, work over to the general of the military. And he just made an edict. We're going to vaccinate everybody and everybody's going to be careful about where they vax, um, they facilitate. And they got a, a record low number of infections and so forth because they had one person in charge. In the United States, we had uh, the same kind of thing, except that one person had started out calling it a hoax of the other party instead of accepting it as an infection. And that affected a whole different political spectrum. So I think in the Asia, we have a challenge. How do we bring a central focus to the very many things we know that fight, fight this infection? We don't have a cure yet that we found. And in fact, some of the scientists are worried about the long-term effects, even of those affected, uh, like the, the infections of uh, the early 2000s. So the challenge is going to be to bring focus to our advantage. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that's thank you for your opening uh, entry into the discussion. Uh, I move to Toshi. Toshihiro Toyoshima yes. is uh, the CEO of Mercuria Investment, and please uh, introduce yourself, and then uh, we'll start off with your first uh, 
diverse oh, yes. uh, analysis. Please go. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I'm CEO of Mercury Investment, which I started uh, 16 years ago. Uh, prior to starting Mercury Investment, which is the alternative fund management company, uh, I was working with the World Bank. Uh, in 2001, uh, China joined WTO and Vietnam signed uh, an investment and tra trade and investment agreement with the U.S., uh, which really changed uh, the momentum of the global economy, and, and it was a timing of global integration. So uh, I was a kind of believer of the more integrated world, and and therefore uh, I quit the World Bank and set up Mercury Investment, uh, which is focusing on uh, investing into cross-border uh, business activities, um, and and I I think uh, in overall uh, it was quite interesting timing. Even though we had the Lehman shock in between, uh, all the investment we made at the very beginning, uh, thanks for the enlarged uh, global uh, middle class people, I I, I think I uh, had done uh, quite well. Um, and uh, as a multi strategy alternative fund managers, uh, we do have various uh, type, types of the fund. Uh, one of the fund uh, had, uh, is in the aviation industry. And not surprisingly, that is an industry which was hit uh, with the COVID-19 the most. Uh, but looking into the global economy through our investment into the aviation industry, uh, it reminds me of various interesting viewpoints. Uh, first of all, the COVID-19 uh, hit the all the uh, countries in the world at the same timing. So it was like the Olympic game. And uh, in the sports, uh, there are various types of, of play style uh, in the soccer. Uh, the German play style and Italian play style, British play style, or the Brazilian. They are all different. And so the reaction to the COVID-19 was greatly diversified according to the, uh, to the, the uh, to, 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 to the way of the government. Uh, some government, which is more authoritarian, uh, took the initiative, uh, in controlling everybody's, uh, locking down everybody immediately. And, and so, some government, uh, well, uh, which allowed the, the, <clears throat> the, how, how can I say, uh, experiment, uh, uh, I, I've got, I, I do not have the technical word, but like a Sweden or the UK try to experiment the, 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 the uh, people's getting the, <clears throat> uh, 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 in, anyway, so, so there are many, many ways, uh, dealing with the crisis, uh, at the same time, uh, we, which started at the same time, and some country did better ahead of the others, and some com country had been blamed for not, not doing well. But in the second round, uh, the, the, the front runner in the first round does not guarantee these country will, uh, will really uh, handle the, the, the pandemic, uh, nice, nicer than the other in the second round. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, Korea or Taiwan, uh, which reacted very strictly in the very beginning, uh, uh, seems to be the, the winner at the very beginning, but, uh, in the second round, uh, they are suffering as well. And, um, originally it was the issue of the, uh, lack of the vaccination, but now, uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, the government is now uh, recommending the third shot. And, 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 and I, I think Biden administration tried to force some uh, government employee to, to take vaccination. But uh, I, I, I think the vaccination rate in the U.S. remains at around 60%. So uh, it's not the issue of the shortage of the vaccination, but uh, I, I think it started to highlight the different way of perceiving uh, uh, the human rights or how uh, people, uh, uh, is it the freedom of the people not to take vaccination or not? Uh, I, I'm quite interested uh, in the view of Michael uh, when, uh, how, as a U.S. citizen, how you see the, 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 the choice uh, being given to uh, each individual. Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, there are various difference. But uh, uh, coming back to the air traffic, uh, the, the, the domestic flight in the U.S. is almost back to 19, uh, 2019 level. And China is more over 2019 level. So the domestic businesses, despite COVID, uh, is ongoing. Uh, we do have buyout investment uh, in auto parts industry, uh, which has a factory in China. And uh, that company is 
performing quite well uh, with the expansion of the production uh, by Tesla, the U.S. company in China. So that's a kind of the sense of the globalization. So some industry is hit, but uh, but actually the people's lives are going going on, and 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 there's a uh, still the continu continuous growth uh, domestically in each country. However, when it comes to international travel, uh, because of the difference of the vaccination rate. Uh, is uh, used as an excuse for the government to selectively close the door or the control the gate uh, from one country to another country. Um, Michael mentioned uh, in Asia, uh, I, I, I'm not sure uh, if Asia, Asia is uh, taking the strict measure or not, but uh, in general, all the Asian countries' vaccination rate is pretty high. Uh, uh, Japan, China, Korea, all over 80 percent. I, I think Singapore, Taiwan, uh, or, or, or Hong Kong. Uh, but the uh, when it comes to the business traffic, uh, still uh, all the con countries are still uh, maintaining a pretty strict uh, lockdown. Uh, one of the reason is maybe uh, people are not sure how effective the Chinese vaccine is, but maybe it's effective. But uh, it's, uh, there are some good reasons that uh, they do not trust each other. So uh, the international air traffic, uh, while the domestic travel is coming back, international travel is still at a very low rate, maybe 20 to 30 percent uh, of the 2019 level, uh, which is that far behind Europe and the U.S. Anyway, <laughs> Doshi, so thank you, Doshi, for sharing your experience around the aviation and your perspective between the Asia different countries. And I like the analogy of the Olympic game and everyone played the game. Mm. Uh, they were ahead and then somehow they felt they were backward. They came back again. Uh, coming back to uh, Trista again uh, for another uh, intriguing question that comes to me. While we were going and still going through this whole COVID, there's been a big leap in the uh, in the funding of many new startups. So that that's also happening. Uh, can you share some thoughts in regard to what sort of uh, startup or which domain and uh, who are getting high funding? A and B. Uh, is it because they have been addressing issues that came out of pandemic or they accelerated the solution problem? So what kind of startups are getting more funding at this time, which is quite, encour which is quite encouraging? Yes. And actually, I would say, um, just to give a bit of background, there's an article. I haven't read it yet. Read it yet. Um, I need to read it, but I saw it come across my news feed. But the Economist just did an article about the massive increase in venture capital funding. I think there'll be in the U.S. alone, I think 200 billion roughly this year. And I think within three years, it's supposed to more than double. And so this is kind of an interesting dynamic because it's it's a part of the market that actually was expected to completely fall apart during COVID. And actually the reverse mm -hmm. happened. Now, on, you could say that there was an argument that the central bank uh, were kind of pumping and printing a lot of money. So there's more cash kind of floating around the system. But I would say that actually what's happening is I think people are looking for, one, investors are looking for higher returns. And I think people are also looking for solutions um, to address many of the mm. challenges we have as societies. So first of all, the digital transition is something that's really been um, a fundamental shift in how we kind of engage, interact as human beings. It was pivotal to have these tools during the pandemic. It actually yeah. helped a lot of industries keep going um, but what we've learned is actually that there's a lot of pockets of society where we are not digitized enough, right? So in Japan, for example, in the corporate structure in Japan, this is a huge topic. We call it DX in Japan, digital transformation. Mm, that's right. Um, and this is a huge topic, right? Because now people are seeing, well, actually during the pandemic, it would have been really helpful <laughs> to have had some of these technologies. So what's happening is that any companies that are in this sector are starting to get a lot of investment. And this is happening globally, not just in the United States, this is happening in Europe, it's happening in, throughout Asia, which is a really fascinating um, trend. We're starting to see, there was a huge leap as well in climate technology over the last couple of years. Um, um, and I think by the mid point of last year, I think in terms of all of climate tech, the funding doubled over what had been raised or had, I think they raised over the last six months, everything that was raised the year prior. 
So mm -hmm. it's a sector where people are seeing a, an important role for addressing many of our climate issues, but also an opportunity, a financial opportunity, right, to kind of to kind of gain more funding. So anything that moves corporations or bureaucracies into technology is really being funded pretty heavily. So enterprise software, for example, which has always been very hot, continues to be anything that's dealing with you know, climate technology, that's a huge hmm. space. And then a third, of course, we can't really um, ignore the incredible innovation that's happened with vaccines. And vaccines are actually a, sec as a sector that actually has been underinvested over the last I don't know, 15, 20 years, all of a sudden now <laughs> we're starting to see biotechnology pick up in that sector. So there's many areas, you know, certainly anything that deals with kind of delivering things to people at home. Um, this is a big topic. You know, we're still seeing um, backwards and forwards between people working at home and going into offices. So we're going to continue to see these hybrid models. So any technology that facilitates that. So it's actually really an exciting thing because we may actually start seeing a shift towards newer, innovative companies that may actually help the overall system, I think, um, become more uh, dynamic. So I think there's a lot of really fascinating things going on there. That's good. Uh, that's music to many startups, Trista, because you know, a lot of people in this last two years have gotten onto the entrepreneurial bandwagon as yes. well. Uh, some of them were forced because they were home, they were stuck and they were thinking, came up with some great ideas. So it's very encouraging to see that kind of funding coming. I would say just one last point on what sure, you said sure. about people leaving. So in the U.S., you know, a lot of people are leaving the workforce. This has been a huge topic, right? Um, I think it's a misperception that people are sitting at home. That's not what they're doing, actually. There's some people sitting at home, but a lot of people are actually creating new companies. So exactly. I think we'll see what know, happens next year and the years following. But it's quite fascinating, fascinating dynamic. But no, please, sure, right, sure. Uh, and you know, thanks for uh, clarifying that. So, so Michael, I have a question because you know your capital group would would have exposure of a spectrum of different verticals and companies. What we saw in the past eighteen months or nineteen months, uh, a lot of value chains were localized and regionalized. There were issues with logistics and exports, you know, and. Uh, in some way, without saying it, uh, it felt that people were moving in against the globalization and, you know, putting barriers and having local manufacturing and supplies for all the reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that you see now and how do you see that going forward? Is it a knee jerk reaction? Is it going to be a little bit more permanent than that or, or what? If I may I ask you, this thing. I think it'll be more of the same. For instance, in the United States, we had a startup electric truck company called Ravinia, and uh, it hired a lot of people and uh, put them to work in a building electric trucks, pickup trucks, in uh, an old abandoned. Detroit plant, when they came out with their first production of trucks, the whole production was bought by the workers. And it was oh. never sold outside of the workers. Now, you know, from now on out, that's going to be a big advantage because uh, the advertisements will say, own the truck that those who built it built. But it's still very localized. And um, I think, in fact, there's going to be more of that uh, from uh, just worry that supply chains are disrupted and have been because of uh, things beyond the control of the supply chains to the fact that, that people were going to like to buy local things, whether it's food or pickup trucks. Okay. So this was an interesting example you brought out. Uh, and, and where are they at this point? I mean, they're continuing to produce, and is it uh, going beyond the workers, or hmm. where where are they at this point? 
Well, you know, the big companies, the big box companies, Sears and Kmart, hmm. are failing. They're, oh, yeah. It used to be the companies that everybody wanted to own because of their size and reach. But hmm. now that people are buying locally, the big box stores are in the United States are finding that uh, the companies like Sears and Kmart are mm. shedding their stores because they can't sell enough. Mm. And I think that's yeah. because, you know, the people like to buy locally, not distance. Got it. I think there has been a, and also because of the, e-consumer and retail uh, online purchases, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural shift of the new world, people younger is, is, is changed. Uh, Toshi, before I come to you, uh, and this is regarding more of Asia than the world, that uh, uh, we see a, a new consumer map that is being, uh, that, that's actually building up most of for Asia, that they say that in five, 10 years of time, the world, consumption, 50% of the consumption would be in Asia. And, you know, this new, what they call the digital natives who are born mm -hmm. between 1980 and beyond, you know, they are mm -hmm. on a different spree. So uh, we'll come to that later. But the question that you touched earlier was uh, the analogy of Olympics and soccer mm -hmm. and different types and countries yes. responding. There is a central role, you like it or not, of the government that came okay. into a forefront oh, during exactly. the COVID yes. time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you said that since you had worked with the World Bank before, mm -hmm. and you know, you, your approach was more of uh, to be more open and yet integrated. Uh, yes, uh, integrated global uh, do, economy, yes. Do, do, you, do you see uh, head, headwinds uh, built up during this time, which will die off, or uh, there's still a bit uh, uh, resistance to that, if I may ask you? That's a very deep question. Well, uh, in reality, unfortunately, uh, the global uh, in integration is uh, taking the diverse move right now, uh, and um, and especially uh, the the current uh, difficulties are between U.S. and China, different style. Uh, so uh, the most important thing is uh, when. You, you mentioned about the government. Uh, under the democracy, uh, government is elected and set up by the people. But uh, in many Asian countries, uh, they think government comes first and people belongs to the government. That's a different perception of how, uh, what the role of the government is. So, uh, especially for the uh, countries in Asia who used to be colonized, uh, the government thinks uh, they, they got to protect their own people uh, against the uh, other country and it's a role of the government. At the same time, the U.S. thinks uh, people, uh, uh, of course, are free of the government and, and can choose a destination of living. And uh, what the, what what's problematic uh, in the U.S. Uh, is that uh, many uh, platform companies are now uh, becoming beyond the existence, beyond the government, and uh, they may not be controlled by the government, and they may they can do the business freely all over the world, except China. But uh, so uh, government and the, the and uh, we I, I'm in investment business and many of you are as well. So uh, I'm not hiding the truth. The truth is the profit is coming from the consumers, and uh, consumers. The how many how how large market are you control uh, is uh, reflective of the valuation of your investment, and. To a certain extent, uh, the government can control which consumer you can have for your own market, and it's a source of the uh, value. So, so like the petroleum, uh, controlling the big pool of the consumer population is now considered like the the advantage of the competitiveness, uh, which uh, the 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 Ch China is currently doing. It's a very big market, a uh, mother market. Uh, if if Google or, or, or whatever 
Microsoft uh, can do the free network business in China, maybe there's no Baidu or uh, that kind of services. So uh, this is a very difficult question. So uh, government, the relationship between government and people, government and 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 corporate, uh, and uh, we control which uh, is uh, becoming very questionable. And the technology seems to solve many things, but at at, at the same time, uh, there's a great difficulty to really reach out to the uh, really who are in need of the uh, opportunities. So, uh, well, I, I think this is not a straightforward answer, but uh, the, uh, COVID yeah. gives us many aspects to think over. Thank you, Toshi. I know this is was a deep dive question and, you know, you don't wrap it up in a few minutes, but it's a good teaser for us to think about it. Uh, going to Trista again, uh, I know that uh, we touched upon the headwinds of glo deglobalization or not, because it's very intrinsic to the economy that was built earlier in a certain way. And, and, and if there are changes, then, or not, or, or whatever. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's yeah. a knee-jerk reaction for a short time. It is it, or it's going to come back, as uh, Michael said. Uh, you know, this is a temporary phase. That people will get back to where it was. Yeah. What do you think about it? I think that actually, um, I think that it probably most likely will be a period of time in which we start to kind of retrench a little bit. I don't think it will be, you know, I think throughout history, it's, you know, we always kind of ebb and flow. And that's who we are kind of as, as humanity, right? And we come closer, we pull farther apart. And I think we're going to go through a period of time of maybe pulling apart a little bit. But I think there is probably one um, thing that's going to disrupt that a little bit. Um, and that's probably what Toshi was mentioning, the consumer. And one thing that's actually happened in the last, you know, 20 years or so is that consumers wherever they are in the world, even in emerging countries where people don't have maybe as much, have gotten used to convenience. And the one thing that we know about the global economy that it's provided us is convenience. If we want mm -hmm. something immediately from around the world, we get it. And now when we're seeing these disrupted supply chains, you're hearing all these stories about Christmas, people aren't going to be able to get their you know, mm -hmm. gaming consoles, or in the <laughs> UK, they're not going to be able to get their turkeys, or what have you. <laughs> people are incensed about not having these things. Hmm. Even though, to be perfectly honest, they don't really need those things, right? Um, we could just buy local products and we could support local producers and maybe live and exist with a little bit less. But I think it's going to be hard to kind of get the consumer mind mindset shifted hmm. back to waiting. And that's going to have that's going to put a lot of pressure on the system. And so I think companies are going to have to manage this perception issue of, you know, I think that's the thing is consumers aren't really very clear about what mm. they want. And that's very difficult, I think, for companies, right? Going back and forth between providing them convenience, but also supporting the kind of the local guy <laughs> that I know who's, who's connected to me. So, um, so just to kind of wrap it up, I think that it will probably be, uh, I, I don't think that we're gonna go back to a model where everything is, is delocalized, you know, where everything is kind of deglobalized. I don't think that's gonna actually happen, but it'll maybe be somewhere middling in the middle for mm. a period of time. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Trista. I know it's uh, uh, it's probably going to be most likely going forward in the globalization with a with a, a flavor of uh, a local uh, a local flavor added to the global flavor is maybe what we might be going forward mm -hmm. and looking at stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, Michael, again, uh, uh, this. Uh, this little bit of a posturing and a trade that we see uh, between America and China, because, you know, there's a whole lot of impact that comes out of it to Asia, manufacturing, uh, moving factories or not, uh, uh, containers move or not, freight of rates have gone up twice, thrice, because there's not enough containers available. Goods are ready, but they can't move because of the shortage of all this. Uh, I think it's a hundred trillion dollar question going forward in the next five years. But if you had a crystal ball, what would you share in regard to this uh, this this uh, headwinds between the two uh, large economies? 
I think that competition will not be as great between the two large economies. The United States is just passing、uh, a new, very expensive, multiple expense、um, bill to build back better. And this、uh, reminds me of when I was growing up in the 1950s, and Eisenhower launched a highway bill, and that highway bill made it available to trucks, and the trucks meant that people could grow food in California and ship it to the east. In the middle of the winter, and we then stopped importing so much food from abroad. So I think the Build Back Better bill, focusing on our infrastructure, everything from internet to highways, is going to make foreign competition less of a competition. And the transportation difficulties are going to make the consumer less willing to expose themselves to the vagaries of、um, supply chains. So I think the whole theory that we grew up with in the 20th century that. Wherever it's cheapest to build, that's where we're going to buy it. I think now it's going to be wherever we can appeal to the consumer, we have the ability to get the product to them. Whether it's a pickup truck, newly electrified, or food that's grown by satellites, and Um, can be bu- built in greenhouses, even in the next door、um, county. So I think all global competition will become suspect and、uh, okay. lead to advantage. Does it,、uh, Michael? Does it mean that?、Uh... Obviously, the United States economy was so dominated by services over time, you know, and、uh, that you're going to see、uh, that the world will see a larger in the in the pie chart, a larger share of、uh, relative to before of manufacturing as well. Because you're talking about build back better. It's not just service, but production, manufacturing. That's a very good point, and I think it's valid. I think we finding ways through our technology and infrastructure to make services available. For instance, in the pandemic,、um, medical services that used to be all localized have become telemarketing, and we now do a lot of medical services through the internet. And technology in the United States, and a lot of doctors are being trained to do that, to do telemarketing and teleservices.、Um, legal services are now being advertised throughout the United States, even though that they're not local. And、um, car dealerships are selling cars. They haven't figured out a way to sell the mechanics that then work on the cars, but you know that's going to be next if they can figure out how to teach、uh, teach kids who are twelve today that when they get to be eighteen or twenty、uh, they can fix a car wherever they are、uh, remotely. So I think that's a very good point. Thank you, Michael uh, Toshi. Uh,、hmm. Since、uh, you look at a lot of investments in different industries, and、uh, you talked about aviation, you talked about 
which got impacted, but he also talked about other industries that actually got uh, some wind in the sail during the time. Uh, yes. Going going forward, how do you see that? Do you see some industries like uh, maybe a, a healthcare or, or, or ag tech or education mm. tech or, uh, uh, ha, ha, you know, the, the yes. sprinters, if I may use the word? Mm. Uh, well, uh, I, I think uh, Tricia already mentioned, but um, uh, uh, COVID uh, has uh, put a big challenge to the traditional industries. And uh, even without COVID, many traditional industries had been under pressure to reform themselves or change the way of doing businesses. Uh, however, uh, because of the existing regulation or the uh, uh, or, or the psychological resistance to change by the ex uh, incumbent management. Uh, many sectors had been quite slow in changing, but actually when the lockdown started, uh, well, uh, the physical contact, when the physical contact is restricted, uh, that's a place uh, where technology uh, can be introduced. And, and uh, it sure created a huge business opportunity for the tech companies uh, who's bringing in the new technology into the, in, into the seasoned industry. Uh, well, I hope the, the best way is the technology improves the existing industries. Uh, but uh, something quite uh, embarrassing is that uh, tech people think uh, it's t waste of the time to convince uh, existing players to change. Therefore, the tech industry starts the medical industry, tech industry starts the real estate industry, so uh, to replace the existing ones, uh, which is creating some uh, social uh, uh, frictions. Uh, but, but definitely, yeah, uh, there's money. The, when there's opportunity, when there's a challenge, uh, there's opportunity and there's money to, uh, we, that will be invested to overcome. Thank you, Toshi. You know, it reminds me that uh, it's not that the technology uh, industry goes into all kind of industries. Mm. It it tries to go in only because the adoption of technology. Mm. In these industries have either oh, exactly. been slow. Mm. And, and so these guys, so tech industry says, I want to go and change the healthcare or the real uh, estate or, or logistics. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, let, let, me just, let me just add one, one, one more aspect. Uh, it, it highlights the, the, the different way of thinking across the genders. So uh, millennials, the younger generations think differently and more freely. Whereas the older generation is still uh, captive to the traditional way of thinking and authoritarian uh, hierarchy. I understand. You know, I think going forward, the demograph of the world will, uh, I'm sure, propel the adoption mm. of technology on fingertips. So uh, yeah. that's the guaranteed thing I see going forward because of the mm. young generation, digital natives born with a keyboard, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. So, guys, we've got uh, two more minutes. If I can just ask each one of you, starting with Trista, then then Michael, and then uh, Toshi, to just give a a a one or less than a minute uh, closure uh, remarks of what you feel like summarizing your whole thought on this subject. Thirty seconds, or sure, very yeah. short. I'd say just quickly, I, I'm actually, you know, it's been very difficult the last two years, I think, for everyone, right? It's been a bit of a nightmare for many people. Um, I do think, though, there's a lot of positive change that will hopefully happen from this time, which is, you know, things we've talked, new innovation. I think the things that Toshi was mentioning around, you know, tech companies' role in the world and kind of thinking about their impact on society and perhaps being more responsible, building more responsible technology mm. and you know, thinking about the disruption that may happen, right? Um, and, and, and coming up with a way to kind of managing through, manage through that. But I think I'm actually quite encouraged about the next few years. And I do hope that on the sustainability front, mm. we can deploy a lot of this thinking and technology towards that. Thank you, Trista. Michael, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever. We're on time now, but. I think the big issue will be public communications because, um, the people who are not being vaccinated will be subject to other kinds of difficulties. And what we have to figure out is a better way 
to communicate to our large and diversified populations. Thank you. And Toshi, mm. closure remarks? Well, uh, I, 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 I think uh, the uh, government people may also uh, um, change their way of thinking. Well, I, I think there's no discipline in the government spending and, and populism is coming back. And in, in, instead of uh, fighting with the crisis altogether, uh, there's, we, we are seeing more, much and much deeper division uh, inter, uh, uh, internationally and internationally. So uh, I, I, I really hope there will be younger leadership uh, coming uh, right. from uh, each, each, each government to 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 believe in the uh, more integrated world. Yeah. He's gone. Oh, he dropped. He's gone. Yes. Yeah.